I am Jeffrey Villardouin in the Kievan Rus campaign from Rusici Total War, a mod for Medieval 2 Total War Kingdoms. We are in the year 1205 and I will be flying through the years for a bit as we have conquered all the rebel territories that were there to conquer and we must now build strong armies to be able to take on the other Rus factions. Our very capable general uh, in Kosice, Andre the Just, has died. We have several new buildings in Paraislav and elsewhere, queues have been stalled. Andre the Just, as we said, has died. And uh, we're in the winter now of 1205. We are at the top faction on several departments. We have a new member of the family, Kia of Kursk, he has betrothed one of our princesses, so there are now marriage celebrations, and we're moving over to the year 1206. We have another wedding, Daniel has been betrothed to Sophia of Pokhov. The dreaded plague has broken out, so here are the marriage celebrations between uh, Daniel and Sophia. We have uh, retrained some of our militia units and we have a new priest and a blacksmith in Kremenich. Kondrat of Kaluga, one of our family members, has died in Sverskaya. We have various princesses born and so on. We are the top faction overall and militarily, also in terms of population. We have abysmal relations with the Cumans. We have retrained some of our militia in Kiev. And we have now Baron's stables in Kiev. So one of our priests has died and one of our diplomats we are now also the most advanced faction, so we have uh, the top production, so we're nearly now uh, the top faction in every respect. Here's that area in uh, Poland, southern Poland or Czechoslovakia, where we are controlling several uh, small villages uh, with the help of the Byzantines and the Poles. This was the area that the um, Hungarians has, had infiltrated into, and we had to take some of these uh, places in order to stop the Hungarian expansion. And we're moving over to the year 1207. There has been a magnificent harvest. And a war has been declared between the Cumans and the Seljuks. We have more units retrained at Kiev in the fortress there. We have a royal epiary in Novosil and a leather tana in Vladimir Volinsky. And uh, a merchant has died, Boris Kradov, and another merchant in Thrace, Zakaria Pukishev. We have some new family members, Ksenia of Kursk, Agafia Vinkov, and other Ksenia. Some of these names are not pure Slavic. Uh, the Slavic language was not always the most prominent language in uh, Russia at the time when the Rus uh, had made contact with the Byzantines, the ruling class were Scandinavian Vikings that had infiltrated uh, Russia and they had even reached down to the Black Sea. And that's how they came in contact with the Byzantines. Harald Hardrada, the Viking ruler who invaded England, had actually lived in Russia for a time, and he had also been in the Varangian guard of one of the Byzantine emperors. I understand that the first Russian chronicle was written in a kind of Old Norse in the 11th century, but eventually the Slavic language became the uh, dominant language, and so the old Viking names were translated into Slavic in later chronicles like uh, the names we see in this mod, like Pukishev and Krotov and Vinkov and so on. So the Rus previously had names like, for example, 
uh, Svedeborg or something, and Svedeborg became Sviatopolk, which means the same thing but in the Slavic language. And so the names were translated from the Old Norse to Slavic. And they sound similar, but not quite. And so in the later chronicles, we have the original Old Norse names replaced with uh, Slavic. Um, they are Slavic translations, those that could be translated. And the rest were just changed and so that they sound a little bit Slavic. Uh, the Rus also adopted Christian names that we see here, and also the Roman names of the months, uh, January, February, March, and so on, and the Greek names for some numbers, and so on, as well as words of old church Slavonic, the language of Slavic Christianity that originated in the Slavs that had settled in the Byzantine Empire sometime, I believe, around the 7th century. Um, as you think, all these linguistic elements, including Christian and Greek names, such as Zakaria, Xenia, that we see here, enter the uh, Russian language when the Viking style Rus came into contact with the Byzantines and adopted Christianity. I find this an amazing and little known aspect of European history that people and languages moved so much across Europe in the Middle Ages. Uh, this aspect of European history uh, has been airbrushed by the more nationalistic narratives of uh, more recent centuries. Uh, very few people realize that um, the Scandinavians reached the Black Sea and uh, Sicily and so on. It's um, quite amazing to think about that. We hardly think of Italians today as being Scandinavian or Germanic, for example, in, uh, in any way even though their lands were for a long time under Scandinavian rule, under the Longobards and the Normans. And in fact, the prominent languages were probably Germanic and Old French for some time, and not Italian. Uh, we definitely don't see that aspect of European history very much. Uh, it's not very highly promoted. We have a much more nationalistic style narrative where every country has its language and always has that language. So anyway, let's go back to the uh, campaign. So as I said, we're in the year 1207 and uh, we are a very strong faction at the moment. The Teutonic Knights have arrived on the scene, they've spawned, it's a new faction in the game now. We have various new buildings built in various places, production is high, as we just read. Another one of our members, Gleb the Honorable, who's a very prominent member, he has died, Q's have stalled. Uh, the most advanced faction now is the Kingdom of Denmark. They are also Scandinavians, they are spreading their culture. Um, and we're off to the year 1208, and we have uh, a suitable prince betrothed to Rogneda of Kursk. Yaropolk Tenshin, another prince, feels appreciated for some reason. And now we have uh, Stroil Nezata married to Rogneda, who's now Rogneda Nezata. We have a small Orthodox chapel built in Sharokan in former Cuman lands. Uh, another family member, Yuri, has died, uh, a couple of merchants and a priest, I think, as well. Denmark is now, um, has the highest production. Uh, there's a war now between the Kingdom of Poland and the Byzantine Empire. Both were our allies, it's very inconvenient. I think both were our allies. Uh, we have an Orthodox chapel built in Nushi, also in the former human land. And Esif of Turov, a merchant who's died in Dalmatia. One of our generals feels appreciated. We are back to being the faction with the highest production. A war has been declared between the Kingdom of Poland and the Byzantine Empire. Our alliance with the Kingdom of Poland are, is, is in Tartars because we're allies with both of these factions. So we've chosen to stay allies with the Byzantines. We have a new family member, Ignati. We are still the uh, top faction in nearly every respect, the most advanced faction as well. And we're moving over to the year 1209. 
as we're building an army to take on the other Rus factions. So, uh, the uh, Bulgars are now allies with Vladimir Suzdal Principality. What seems to have happened is that they are now vassals of the Vladimir Suzdal Principality. That's inconvenient, uh, because now that makes Vladimir Suzdal stronger. So we have a new merchant and uh, some uh, light militia units recruited. We have an apiary in Vladimir Volinsky and an Orthodox chapel. Repaired in Nushi, there must have been some riots, I guess, in Nushi by the local Cumans who didn't like the idea of an Orthodox chapel. A priest and a merchant have uh, died, who is still the top faction in most departments. And here is the situation overall on the charts. So uh, we are the strongest faction overall, and we are increasing linearly. The other two Rus factions um, have, um, have uh, stopped growing, it seems, uh, are not quite as strong as they used to be at one point. Uh, we are by far the strongest militarily. We are by far the territorially the biggest faction, and we have by far the biggest population. Probably have as much population as the other two Rus factions combined. And so here is now time for a battle. I will not play this battle. It was a battle against some um, small Hungarian force. And the Hungarians were in Bernia Kosice. We attacked them at night. It looked like they were going to lay siege on Kosice. Uh, they had two forces there. We attacked one of them at night with one of our generals, uh, who is a night fighter and happened to be in the area. And we lit up the night with our flaming arrows. We have destroyed the Hungarian army. The Hungarians keep attacking us with uh, armies consisting mainly of militia. And the cavalry they are throwing at us usually is very light. I don't know how they managed to defeat the Poles. This is a clear victory that goes to only men of great virtue and valor. And so we won great victory. We only lost 73 men. Matuta, I believe, used to be in uh, Nushi, uh, but now he moved over and he is uh, helping us in the area of Moravia or so. He is now in Kosice. So he's gained uh, experience, a lot of experience, in this battle. We took some prisoners, uh, quite a few prisoners relatively light units. We offer them up for ransom. Ransom was rejected by the Kingdom of Hungary. Here's the situation in the Byzantine Empire. We've sent some priests here because the Turks were trying to take Nicaea. Uh, our relations with the Byzantine Empire are now very good. So we are continuing to train units in Kiev. Now it is a, a fortress. And we finished a uh, we, an upgrade of Pereslav, an upgrade of the wall. Uh, another merchant of ours in Bazan Empire died. We failed to capture this Hungarian town in Hungary that our uh, Council of Nobles wanted. I don't know why they wanted this place, and they are now greatly disappointed at this turn of events. Of events. I don't really care. Uh, Chernigov, a large town, is ready to upgrade. We are still a top faction in many respects. Uh, there are some rebels spawning constantly in the former lands of Cumania uh, near Chutuf Kala, which was one of the places we keep taking from them. We had donated Chutuf Kala to the Byzantines at some point. But the Byzantines lost it after a rebellion, so we took it back. And there's another rebellion. We have wiped out the entire population of Cumania. We have exterminated everyone, but there's still rebellions. So I guess they are coming from somewhere else. The Cumans are very persistent. 
So we fought those rebels. It was a very easy victory. And uh, the uh, general who won the victory, Dmitry Tucha, is now respected, or feels respected. We have a mission to make diplomatic uh, contact with the Teutonic Order. There are riots in Nushi. The uh, people have come back out of the graves to haunt us. The people we exterminated. There is more retraining of units in uh, Kiev mainly. And uh, now Kiev is a citadel. It has been upgraded. So the fortress of Kiev is now a citadel. We are building a catapult uh, factory in um, in the citadel. We have a new merchant and a new priest. We have a new general, a faction member, Cosma of Kaluga. The town of Bryansk is ready to upgrade. And uh, Vladimir Suza Principality now has the highest production. We are doing reasonably well financially. We have projected totals of 62,000 gold. Here's um, the situation near Ankara. We've sent our priests there to give um, a little bit of light of hope to the few Christians that still remain in this area after it was overrun by the Turks. So they help uh, spread back the word of the gospel. Here's the situation in Hungary. You see there was a Hungarian army there on the other side of the uh, Danube. And um, here's the northern part of Russia where we border with the uh, Vladimir Suza principality. We have some forces gathering there. Here's the area around Crimea and uh, Cumania. And the Hungarians that were near the Danube Bridge have been reinforced, and now they are attacking the force that was guarding the Danube Bridge. And so here's the, um, the here are the Hungarian armies. They are mostly light armies, but they have a lot of men, and we are going to defend the bridge. It is unwise to praise the day before sunset, but our men are winning the battle and forging a worthy victory. And so the battle has started. Uh, we are defending outside of the bridge. The Hungarians are gate crushing outside. They are desperate to get into Moravia. The other side of the fence is always greener. They don't like staying in Hungary. The enemy general flees like the coward he is. Press onward and break the spirit of his army. So it looks like this first army was mostly infantry and uh, they mass routed. We took their general prisoner, probably, or killed him as that army was routed. And now the second army has arrived. Or maybe that's a leftover from the first army. A few very light horse archers, they have decided to fight in Mali. But uh, there are more men coming. There are the routed units of this first Hungarian army, or it is the vanguard of the second Hungarian army. There are still a few Hungarians interspersed among our men. They are fighting. We are rearranging our lines. We're bringing more men to the right, which has been weaker. So the enemy is attacking with his skirmishers in melee for some reason and they break instantly. So they must have belonged to the first army and they had routed, so they had very low morale. And so they are trying to route again through our lines, some of them at least. The rest the is in head our back. Favor. If we remain true and wholehearted, victory will be ours. We must remain true and wholehearted then. And so we are uh, firing uh, flaming arrows at the backs of the retreating units. And here is uh, a proper general, a Hungarian general with a bodyguard. He uh, is the commander of the second Hungarian army. So he has attacked by himself or on his own with his bodyguard. It's nice to see the Hungarians having at least one heavy unit. Favor. If we remain true and wholehearted, 
victory will be ours. We shall remain true and wholehearted, my friend. So, the Hungarian general has been joined by some infantry and the Hungarians had a ballista. The second Hungarian army probably had a ballista with them and they are hitting our men with a the ballista there. They caused some casualties. Very annoying. We are firing flaming arrows. We had a lot of we have a lot of archers in the rear and they're firing flaming arrows to lower the morale of this army and cause a mass rout. The uh, ballista keeps firing at the side of our men. And again, so annoying. Here is the enemy commander, the enemy general. The Hungarians have mostly uh, vanilla models, but somehow the vanilla models of the Hungarians look better than vanilla, as if they have been reworked or something. They look better in Rosici. I don't know how or why. So it looks like the Hungarian general is left with just one of his bodyguards. He is here. And uh, his men are routing, they are mostly very light militia, some of them are peasants with uh, agricultural implements instead of weapons. The enemy general doesn't give up, here he is with uh, the one and only bodyguard left to him. The rest of his army has routed and his last bodyguard has died. And I don't know what he's trying to do at this point. Is he, try, is he trying to route through our lines or is he wanting to fight? So we had a militia unit here with spears and now he's stuck between the militia units here and the rest of our army behind him. He is fighting to the death so he probably had uh, broken and the rest of his army has retreated. He has been abandoned here. And so I guess we are going to take him prisoner. Capture the enemy enemy general. General. Guard him well, give the dog some wine, and be sure he can see us defeat the rest of his army. So we're taking the enemy general prisoner. His name was Kenes Keblowski or something? And uh, here's our army. Most of the Hungarians have gone back to Hungary. The, the Hungarians still have one unit in good order, and so our cavalry is going to try and take them out. And uh, they still have that ballista battery. There it is on the other side of the bridge. And our cavalry is heading over. Our general is at the front. Let's hope they don't shoot the ballista. Okay, our general's bodyguard made it to the other side of the bridge. The uh, Hungarian uh, ballista crew is silver surfers from the look of it. That's a shame. The battle is in our favor. If we remain true and wholehearted, Victory will be ours. Quickly. Attack. So we have two cavalry units. One is uh, the general's bodyguard who's headed off into the sunset and the other one is the one here. The one here is um, a kind of lighter unit. Here you see them. The enemy are overcome. This is a great victory, worthy of only the mightiest of generals! Okay, so that was a great victory. There's a monastery in the background, very nice. So we only lost 160 men. Here's that unit I was talking about. Uh, a wonderful unit with wonderful marker horses. You find this unit also fighting uh, for Serbia in the Stainless Historical Improvement Project there as a Serbian unit, but uh, they are from uh, Rusici. So our general uh, took a lot of prisoners, some of the militia units took ton of prisoners, 200, 300 uni, uh, men each, because they were routing through our lines, and so that helped them gain experience. So here's the prisoners we took, including one of the family member of the Hungarian royal family. The king of Hungary accepted to pay ransom for his uh, family relation. 
victory, my noble lord. And so that was the end of the battle. We defended Moravia, we defended uh, the Kievan Rus, we are holding the bridge on the Danube, and there's a magnificent harvest as we are wrapping up this uh, episode of the Kievan Rus campaign. Thank you for watching.